It takes a particular kind of person to do maintenance well. There's no love for those who invisibly keep things from going wrong. The work is boring, but you can't let your mind wander. Your tasks are repetitive, but you have to do them right every single time. A maintenance man who loses track of himself is a maintenance man putting everyone he works with in danger. Lives do depend on us, and the greatest workplace tragedies often come from the smallest missed detail. More than all that, the best in maintenance men take a good look at machines that aren't broken on a regular basis. That's how I noticed the problem before anyone else. I was on my morning evaluation when I noticed the first anomaly. The factory was just starting to wake. Sleepy or hungover workers were still wandering in to begin prepping the machines. The boss, of course, wouldn't show up for another hour or two. We should have been resentful, but it was actually the most fun part of the day. Like most mornings, Boyd had his volleyball out, and I gave pleasant grimace as it was sailing over my head. I'd recommended a lighter ball, perhaps the inflatable beach kind, but they hadn't listened. Hunt spiked it back, and I tried not to tense up. The machines were sturdy, but there was a small but non-zero chance that the ball could take a freak trajectory and damage something. I hated small but non-zero chances. They were the bane of my work. Anything that could go wrong, eventually would. When I got to the industrial air conditioning unit on the roof, I was already a little on edge, knowing that these guys were still playing with that volleyball downstairs, but I didn't miss the very small detail that was out of place. The massive air conditioning unit had a small gouge near one of its edges. Standing on my toes to examine it closely, I tried to figure out what might have caused it. The metal showed no signs of stress. There were no nearby scratches. There was just roughly hemispherical piece missing from the chrome frame. It didn't match any problem I could think of. It was very small, and anyone else might have dismissed it, but I didn't like unexplained happenings. The little hole had exposed some of the wiring, and there was an extremely small chance that a spark might pop out at some point. It would only land on concrete, but I didn't like to take chances. Looking around, I studied the roof's hot, wide, and dull concrete landscape. There were a variety of climate control mechanisms up there, but none of them could normally cause any damage like that. At first, I guessed that some kid had shot a BB gun or something, even though the lack of scratches and metal stress made that unlikely. Taking a sweaty little walk across the concrete under the burning morning sun, I searched the surroundings below. The factory parking lot and shipping areas were locked and sealed tight. It was unlikely that anything had come from that direction. The other side of the building faced thick Virginia forest. There hadn't been a need to clear it, so they'd left the ancient pines standing. It was that tangled canopy that I studied at length. Could kids have snuck up through the woods? Despite the growing summer heat at the phase of that morning, I shivered. No matter how bright and stinking hot it was up there, the treetops right in front of me would always cover the land beneath in shadow. Worse, there was a vector from within the trees to ding the air unit. Had something... I shook my head, shrugged off in odd fear, and returned inside to log the damage in my reports. I spent much of the rest of that day keeping my hands busy while I thought about the unexplained damage and the quiet and unhappy forest right out back of our industrial stone palace. On the way out, I heard a slight rumble in the engine of Hunt's truck, but I was too absorbed to mention it to him, and it wasn't strictly company business anyway. Television and beer kept me occupied that night. Two beers, one episode of Gilligan's Island, and nothing from work could bother me. But the next day, as the sun rose over the treetops and lit that concrete landscape once again, I found two more little holes in the air conditioning unit. A slight bit had also been sliced out of a nearby duct, as if by some sharp phantom fingernail. I headed down into the factory to log the strange damages, just in time to see Boyd's volleyball bounce at an unexpected angle. The ricochet took it into an access opening, barely bigger than the ball itself, and I heard something creak and bend. The guys all shouted with worry and concern while I opened a side hatch and found that they damaged the alignment of certain delicate parts. They all begged me not to log the damage, but I had to. 
They pleaded with me not to report how it had happened, and I had to relent. There would be nothing to gain in telling my boss about their morning volleyball ritual. Quietly stressed by the lie I was engaging in on my reports, I replaced the damaged part with spares. I convinced the boss to order for exactly this potential problem. Well, not damaged by volleyball, but the parts were crucial to the factory's operation. The expense had apparently been worth it. As I was cataloging the removed parts, I stopped and stared down at one of them. The smooth metal had a small hemispherical ding missing from its upper curve. Alright, that's... That officially meant something was... very wrong. Logging an official shift into my daily duties, I began going over everything metal in the enormous building inch by inch. Two or three hours in, I'd found no further dings, and I was about ready to head to lunch until I saw a similar hole in the brick wall. It wasn't just happening to metal. What could do something like this to a random brick and metal without any common vectors? Before I could think further, the boss came around. I first felt his presence as he stood all tall and disapproving behind me. What's going on? Expensive part this morning and now you're staring at the wall? I tried to show him the bits of damage I'd found, but he shrugged the evidence off. I understand you're having a tough time, he said, suppressing his own annoyance for a moment. But please go back to work. He began to step away, but hesitated. Or take time off, for God's sake. One or the other. Freaking unnatural that you're here, considering. If that was the way he'd wanted it, I resolved to let the issue go. And grow. I stopped pursuing the unknown cause, but I logged every single ding as they began to show up in more and more places. Eventually, the guys started noticing. Hunt's engine crapped out after work one day, and he opened up the hood to find missing bits from the old plastic and metal parts. Whatever could go wrong, would eventually go wrong. I had told them before. On an otherwise typical Friday, there was a commotion around lunchtime. Boyd's Coffee Cup, nothing fancy like Starbucks, just the local place, had sprung a leak mid-drink. A little circle was missing from the foam, exactly in the shape of the dings we'd been finding. Nobody was around, I heard him tell the others. I was just standing there talking to Weaver, and then the coffee was splurting everywhere. The boss came out of his high office to talk to the men, and I took a surly walk around the premises while he was distracted. I was pissed off enough to head on to the shadowed forest, and I moved along the edge of the building until it turned against the tall trees. There was a thick blanket of leaves back there, and the trees were far enough apart to walk between without much trouble. It was right there. If anyone had bothered to go out back, they'd have seen it immediately. They might have thought it was something Boggs had done to the leaves, but I'd known better now. It was exactly what had been done to the brick metal, plastic, and cardboard, only much more widespread. The leaves had been dinged through and through, leaving the tree in tatters. That meant it could happen to living stuff. Anxious as hell, I ran back around to the front, wondering if the thick walls of the factory had been protecting us from... whatever this was. Could it hurt us? Would a chunk suddenly go missing from me if I played around back there too long? In a scared frenzy, I went to the boss and even dared to show him the back. I could see it on his face. I knew he believed me. But he said otherwise. This is natural. Little critters do this every summer. We can't shut the factory down. That costs the company millions and me my job to boot. I think you should take some time off. Seriously, you've got 13 days leave. Why don't you take it? Just like that, he put me out instead of shutting the place down. The first nights, my usual two beers became four and then six. I didn't exactly joke around with the guys, but I liked Boyd and Hunt well enough. What if a ding went missing from their heart while they were working the lines or their brain? Would they just be fine one moment and then dead the next? They both had kids. 
At first nights, I wallowed in anger and fear, but did nothing. The weekend came, and I was less agitated, knowing that nobody was in an immediate danger, but Monday rolled around and brought it all right back. Nobody called or contacted me to ask if I was okay, but my thoughts were still with them. That second night off work, my usual two beers became six again. This time, I did something. The boss had forgotten to take my keys. I wasn't really fired in any case, but I might be if they caught me on the premises at night. But it had to be done. I spent a few hours going every inch of the place by flashlight. The little holes and stuff had grown in number. I found them in many of the machines, in the walls, and even the food that had been left in the break room in the fridge. I also found a pile of damaged parts. I knew what the boss had ordered. It was less expensive to just keep getting parts. He'd simply be replacing the dinged pieces and ignoring the problem. Balling up my courage, I crept out back. This time, by flashlight, I found something. It was like a mushroom, spiky, menacing, and alive. They were like burrs I'd seen before in forested areas, but they vibrated ever so slightly as my flashlight fell on them. As I watched one shiver more deeply, and it let off a spike with a silent shot. The little dagger of organic matter flicked by me and I ran to the wall, both to get away from the spiked things and to see if they'd been the cause of the damage. There was no sign of the spike and no damage of the wall outside. On a hunch, I ran around to the front and headed through the darkened factory. Shining my flashlight on the painted brick, I found a spot exactly in line with the shot spike I'd seen. Nothing there. I traced the vector further up. There was a ding missing from the window to the upper office. My boss usually looked down at us from there, and he might have hit it if he'd been standing in his typical spot. I was glad nobody was around, but terrified that I'd been right. The little shaking, spiky things outside were ripping the factory with their spikes. Spikes that could somehow go right through walls. What determined what they hit? Why had some dinged the brick and others metal, and this one glass? How is this possible? And something else occurred to me. Running out back for one last experiment, I shined my flashlight very close to one. It vanished. I hadn't seen them during the day. Bright light made them invisible, somehow. Too scared to stick around any longer, I ran for home and got out my wife's old laptop. Going through all of the Google and Wikipedia and all the science fiction books I could look up, I tried to figure out what was going on. Morning was coming outside by the time I met a nerdy type in the chat room sort of thing. I assume you're pranking me, he wrote. But if it was real, these things were out of phase. Life from another dimension or something, only half there. That would explain why their projectiles go through walls and randomly interact with matter. From the sound of things, they're getting closer to being fully part of our world. Is that bad? I wrote back. I guess. Their spikes should stop going through walls then, making them less dangerous, but then we'll have a hostile invading plant species messing up the ecosystem. Oh, also, just before they fully phase in, they'll be super dangerous. Their spikes will probably start hitting people. You know, while they can still go through matter and not fully anymore. Spikes lodging in your heart, lungs, whatever. Uh, that sounded disgusting, and it was exactly what I feared. The plan, as my anonymous friend and I worked out, was to wait for them to fully come into our world and then burn them all. In the meantime, I had to protect my community. I went to a payphone a few miles distant and called in a bomb threat with a smile on my face. Immediately after, I went home and raised a beer in cheers to my boss who'd lost any choice in the matter of shutting down the factory. There was a small but non-zero chance that they would figure out who had called in the bomb threat, but I ignored my usual concerns and spent the next few days drinking and watching television in a depressed stupor. 
The only thing I did each day was call in a new bomb threat if I heard they were reopening. I didn't really have a way of knowing when the spiked snipers were going to be fully in our world, so I kept sneaking by at night. Every time, my whole body ran with electricity at the possibility that those little demon girls could fire off and I could die without warning. Still, I came around and the night they stopped disappearing under my flashlight, I knew it was time. I had access to industrial amounts of flammable liquids, so I methodically poured the foul-smelling stuff over three square miles of infected forest. It was near two in the morning when a night security guard found me, match in hand. He smelled the flammables and approached, a concerned look on his wrinkled face. Buddy, I've covered you for more times than I care to count, but I have to ask, what the hell are you doing? I'd never met him before. I asked him to clarify about covering for me. Well, you've been coming by all night all the time to get caught up on maintenance work. That you'd get fired if you didn't keep up. At least that's what you said. Uh, it seems to me like you're about to burn the place down. Yeah. It was about that time I started questioning my own mental state. There was a forest full of weird spiky growths towering before me in the warm night air and I dumped flammable liquids all over miles of it. I wasn't sure whether to light my match, not like the old security guard could have stopped me, but you guys came then, as you know. Traced me down after the bomb threats. Small, but non-zero chances. Which is why I'm giving you this statement. I think I've been terribly off since it happened. I know how it looks to you. Man loses his wife, man has troubles at work, man goes back to set the place on fire. Except I didn't. I'm sure I wasn't going to. I truly believe, still, there are weird spike shooting growths out there and that they need to be burned, but I think somebody else should take a look into it and handle it. I can't trust myself. What? What do you mean the place burnt down the next day with everyone inside? Why did they still go into work? Our boss must have... Oh, this can't be real. No, I, I didn't have any sort of delayed ignition advice. Why the hell would I... Oh, God. I never fixed the exposed wires in the air unit on the roof. A spark could have... Hmm. I think I'd like my lawyer now. When I was 12, my mom got too drunk and left me at the after-school program. I say it like it only happened once, but it was actually pretty common until she sobered up the month I left for college. But the time I'm talking about, a gray day in October when I just turned 12, always stood out to me. By 5 o'clock, I knew she wasn't coming, so I walked the mile to the bus station to wait until the 5.30 bus came by. It was a hassle. But I knew the way home well enough, and it was a lot easier to get back on my own than deal with her icy silence and glares that night if I'd called and woken her up. Besides, if left undisturbed, she might not get up until 8 or 9, which meant hours of my pick for TV and dealer's choice for dinner. I reached the bus stop around 5.20 and was glad to find the bench empty. I wasn't too worried about strangers generally, but... Sometimes there were older kids looking to push someone around and some homeless guy you had to keep an eye on the whole time, like he was a strange dog that might decide to bite. So having the bench all to myself was a relief. It's different than it's supposed to be. I jumped and looked forward to the voice with widening eyes. Surprising to find a middle-aged woman sitting next to me on the bench. I hadn't heard her come up at all, much less sit down, and when I jerked my head around, she didn't even seem to notice I was there. 
Dark gray streaked hair pulled back in a tight bun and lips drawn down in a quivering scowl. She was like a character from that old Ichabod Crane story. Not because she was dressed old-fashioned, because she wasn't, but more just the way she looked and carried herself. Thin and gawky, fidgety and yet somehow dignified, she reminded me of a strange, out-of-place bird as she stared out with an expression that was both blank and searching. I was about to look away and try to stay quiet when she rolled her large green eyes in my direction. Can you tell me when it is? Flinching slightly, I nodded, looking down at my digital wristwatch. It had been my birthday gift the week before, and the plastic strap was already starting to crack, but it kept good time. Um, it's... 524? Swallowing, I added, Ma'am? To the end, like an offering to some unknown god I wanted to pass on by without further incident or conversation. Instead of satisfying her, it just seemed to agitate her further. No, no, stupid boy, the date. What is the day, month, and year? I glanced around as I studiously avoided reacting to her odd question. I'd seen this before. Some nut job wanting to listen or maybe scream at, just looking for you to take slight interest or trigger them in some inscrutable way. Still, she was staring at me, and she was an adult. i just answer her and then casually walk away a bit from the stop. I could always run back when the bus showed up. Um... It's October 5th. Her eyes narrowed. In the year. What's the year? I felt my cheeks flush. 1992. Gripping the straps of my book bag like they were lifelines, I stood up from the bench and started heading over to the corner, not looking back or going too fast. Wanting it to seem like I'd remembered something I wanted to see or do... Not that I was trying to get away from anyone. Certainly not the crazy woman who didn't know what year it was. I made it to the corner before I gave in and glanced back. I was half afraid she'd be staring at me, or worse, following behind me, but to my surprise, she wasn't there at all. I glanced further down the street and across to the other side, but there was no sign of the woman anywhere. This was at the edge of the suburbs, so there were a few houses she could have gone behind. But why? I stuck to the corner for a couple of more minutes, but she never came back. And when I saw my bus rounding the turn to the far end of the road, I made my way back to the stop. That's when I saw it. Lying on the bench where the woman had been sitting was a small blue pamphlet. At first, I thought maybe it was a church tract, but when I looked closer at the cover, I saw a penciled figure walking down a dark road that split into a dozen directions ahead. Below the drawing was a slash of red words that burned out from the indigo like a scar. Did you know time travel is both real and possible? I heard the bus hiss to a stop behind me. Taking a final glance around, I snatched up the pamphlet and ran onto the bus, showing the driver my pass, laminated by Mr. Freel at school when he saw how tattered it had become, and heading back to an empty seat to look over my prize. It was only a few pages long, and many of those pages were filled with abstract symbols and figures I didn't recognize then and don't remember clearly now, but the text was clearer, and I committed those words to heart first because of their exotic flavor, and later as a touchstone to something miraculous. During the days and years that followed, times when the weight of reality was rough-edged and heavy and gray, when I sat back on that same bus stop bench almost three years ago, waiting for... something, though I wasn't sure what, those words kept me company until I was no longer alone. Seize the hand of fate, 
The path of time travel isn't found through scientific mastery. It is a thread of perception. Or a line of experiences your consciousness defines in a sequential order. The razor of human reason is far too blunt an instrument to fully understand it, and that's coupled with the inherent fallacies associated with time as a construct for the perception of reality leads to one of the major obstacles most face when attempting time travel. It bleeds the vigor from those that attempt to manipulate it with quantum theory wards you away with vague ideas of impending scorn or mockery if it is discussed seriously amongst most circles of discussion and schools of thought. Well, until you realize that all the tools you actually acquire, those you already possess, to finish your journey, you must simply know how to begin it. And it depends almost entirely on your ability to perceive the world not as it appears, but as you wish it to be. Fiction or lunacy, you may ask. When it comes to this matter, friend, it is neither. Everything finishes as soon as it properly begun. And you begin by understanding one maxim above all others. Time is a lie. The rest of the pages were filled with more drawings, but the only one I remember clearly is a drawing of a blue chess piece. A knight, I think. A man stares at it, a thought bubble above his head saying, I'm at a place where that piece is red. And then the next drawing is of a man smiling as the knight becomes red. It sounds silly talking about it now, but the impression I got from it all back then was that you could change time, or at least change what path of time you were on, if you could just find a particular thing. It, it could be anything, really. Just something you could alter so completely in your mind that it changed reality. Except it wasn't really it that changed. It was you. You traveled to another place another timeline, where that reality you had pictured for yourself was real. I'd spend hours trying to make it work as a kid. I'd pick out a poster on my wall, or the color of my pen, or the type of car that always sat across the street from our apartment building, and try to will some detail of it to change. Never worked, of course, but that never stopped me from trying, from always looking for that magic switch that could flip things from bad to good. Come to find out, the switch was just getting away from there. Not that I didn't have any problems or heartaches after I left home, but college showed me so many new ways of living, so many new friends and opportunities to learn and grow. Well, it may not have been a secret path to a different timeline, but it was good enough for me. And over the years, I've been fairly lucky. No big romances, but a few small ones, and I've never done without work or fun for long. All things considered, this version of things has turned out okay for me. Or at least I thought they had. On June 30th, 2018, I got a text message from a number that I didn't recognize. It didn't say who it was. It just simply said, Go back to the bus stop. It's different than it's supposed to be. My heart leapt in my chest. I knew immediately what it was referring to, impossible as that seemed. I'd never told anyone about that day at the bus stop, never showed the pamphlet to anyone before it eventually got lost somewhere between moves over my adult years. And normally, I'd be a thousand miles away from any shot of visiting the old spot, but not that week in June of 2018. That week, I was home, burying my mother. I thought of a hundred reasons not to go, the chief among them being that it was going to be some weird coincidence or a waste of time. Still... What are the odds of getting that exact message that was uniquely meaningful to me? Especially when I happened to be back in town for the first time in years. 
and it wasn't a question of time. My flight back out wasn't until the following day, and I'd had all the memories and mourning and catching up I thought I could stand for one trip. So I went. The bus stop wasn't much different than it had been 25 years earlier. Someone had installed a new overhang that was maybe a little better at keeping rain off than the old one, and the neighborhood itself had grown up considerably since I'd stopped coming out that way for the after-school program at 14, but, but the benches were the same, I thought. Glancing around and seeing no one, I sat down in roughly the spot I'd been in that day when the woman had appeared and left the mystery look behind. My pulse was up a little, some faint and prickly mix of fear and excitement riding in my blood as I waited for a sign that this was something other than the diversion of a middle-aged man not wanting to spend more time around his old home than necessary. I saw no one out on the street, despite it being just after five on a weekday. Looking around, my eyes caught on a rust-red word scrawled onto the bench down from where I sat. Squinting, I read it out loud. What? Just that, nothing else. And the writing seemed new enough that it was unlikely something more had been obliterated by time, the elements, or even waiting bus passengers as the word what was in the middle of where someone would sit, and it seemed wholly intact. I stared at the word, trying to puzzle out what it meant, or if it had any meaning at all aside from being some kid's cool idea of graffiti. Wasn't even sure what it was written in, though it almost looked like... Fucking bitch. I turned with a jolt to see a man a few years older than me standing a couple of feet away. Dressed in a rain jacket and jeans, he might have just been some random dude coming to wait for the bus if not for the faint buzz... He set off in my head. It was a feeling that sent this man, with his thin face and deep set black dark eyes, was serious and dangerous. In a way, most things I'd encountered in life were not. My legs began to tremble as I searched for the right response. He smirked as he met my eyes. Not you. The man gestured toward the writing on the bench. The woman behind that. I think she's very cute. Always encroaching on someone's territory, acting as though she was above it all. His expression was hard as he found my gaze again. She's not. I nodded, trying to act like I knew what he was talking about when I had no clue. Then a thought occurred to me. Are you talking about an older woman? She'd be... I don't know, maybe 65, 70-something by now? When he just stared at me, I rambled on. I met someone like that when I was a kid, right here at this bus stop. His eyes widened as he let out a bray of laughter. Her? <laughs> no, that's rich. She'd think that was funny, though. I frowned. Who? The woman I met here? The man nodded. Yeah. She's my mother. Her name is Rowena. Mine's Owen. I offered a weak smile. I see. Uh, good to meet you. I'm Mike. Owen chuckled. <laughs> well, yeah. You know I'm the one that sent you that text, right? Swallowing, I gave a nod. I was guessing that when you said she was your mother. I don't know how you found me or got my number, though. I paused, giving him a chance to answer. After several moments of silent staring, I looked away and went on. But I guess I got curious. Curious why I got the text and what it meant. The man stepped closer, sitting down on the what, pointedly as he turned to face me. Do you remember much about meeting Rowena? I nodded more empathetically. Yeah, I do. Very much so. She surprised me. I hadn't known she was there until she said something, and then when I, um, when I looked away, she left without me seeing her go. I think she must have left this little booklet I found. Owen grinned. <laughs> A little blue book? Talking about time travel and shit? 
brightening, I smiled back. Yeah, it was really cool. I read that thing over and over growing up. Always wished I could figure out how it worked. I laughed. I guess every kid wants to go back in time. The man's smile froze on his face. That's not what the book said. Frowning, I shook my head. No, I guess not. He leaned forward, his teeth gritted. Tell me what it did say, then, if you remember it. I felt heat flush my face as a mixture of embarrassment and anger bloomed in my chest. Who was this guy? And where did he get off texting me, tricking me out here, and then giving me attitude about something that happened over 25 years earlier? I wanted to meet his eyes and tell him off, but I didn't quite dare to either. Instead, I just lowered my eyes and responded as calmly as I could manage. It was about changing your timeline. Like, you imagine something is different until you wind up in the timeline where that difference is real. Owen was smiling again, and before I could react, he reached over and patted my shoulder. That's it, man. I couldn't have said it better myself. His smile widened as he went on. Did you ever try it? You know, to make another timeline? I felt myself relaxing a little. Uh, yeah. A lot, actually. My life was kind of shit growing up, and it was a cool way to daydream. I trailed off as he started laughing. What is it? Owen shook his head. (laughs) It's just so funny. You were such a big deal to me at the time, and now? I can see how small and unimportant you really are. His eyes widened. Not to me, you understand. You're still hugely important to me, but just generally. To imagine that I worried about it back then. I stared at him in confusion. Worried about what? What are you talking about? Snorting, he shook his head again as he smiled ruefully. (laughs) Killing you. That day on the bench, I was supposed to kill you. I dreamed about it, you see. My family always dreams about the important kills, and I'd had a dream about you. I felt my legs tensing as I tried to judge the distance to my car, but then I felt a hard pressure on my thigh. Looking down, I saw a small knife tight against my inner leg. When I looked up at Owen, any trace of humor or warmth was gone. I don't plan on killing you now, but I can't adjust that plan if you decide to act stupid, so keep still while we have our nice little talk, okay? I gave a trembling nod, and apparently satisfied, Owen sat back with the knife in his lap. Good. Why? He nodded as he looked out at the empty street. It's not unreasonable. Letting out a small sigh, he went on. My family, going back quite a few years, is special. Part of a very old way of living, called a philosophy or religion if you like, though. I think it's something both simpler and more complex than either. Glancing at me, he smirked again. Most people are born like you. Little more than cattle or sheep. You live small lives and die small deaths, usually with little impact on anything other than the couple of cows standing nearest to you. And even they start grazing around your body soon enough. I don't say this to be condescending, as I truly don't think you have a choice in the matter. It's simply your nature. Clearing his throat, he went on. Then you have the anomalies. The serial killers and mass murderers. Maybe some of them sense something of the truth. But most are just mistakes of nature. Mad animals with a drive to inflict pain because they feel so much themselves or... Because they can't feel any at all. And it drives them crazy. And then there are us. Something higher and better. We kill not out of some warped desire or aberrant purpose, but as part of our journey of ascension toward a higher realm of existence. This may sound crazy to you, and for that I apologize. There's part of me that realizes trying to explain this to you, to make you understand, is like trying to teach a dog how to do calculus or compose a sonnet. But I do feel compelled to try out of some strange respect for you, 
or at least what you mean to me, and perhaps to honor my mother's memory now better than I did when I was young. Sucking in a shaky breath, I shrugged. Tell me what you need to. I'll listen and try to understand. Just please don't kill me. Worried I wasn't responding enough to what he was saying, I threw in, How does this honor your mom's memory? Was she... Was she like you? The corner of Owen's mouth ticked up as he watched me. Oh yeah. She was quite wonderful. Always so clever and full of life and mischief. He gestured in my direction. This time travel pamphlet, for instance. That was taken from some of her things. At one time, it had been used as a talisman, a means of safe travel into territory of another. Leaning forward, he tapped below his eye. We can often sense others of our kind, but not always, and that by itself is not a guarantee of anything. But there are talismans, coded books and symbols, behaviors and phrases and acts that can, to those who know, act like a secret handshake. A way of saying we share the same way of living and walk the same path. At least for a while. He let out a small laugh. <laughs> Mother's way was to make curiosities. Obscure figurines engraved with the right markings or coded messages hidden in what appeared to be secret knowledge or forbidden ritual. I always thought her time travel pamphlets were silly when I was growing up, but after I lost her, I appreciated it more. She always had quite a sense of humor. Wiping the corner of his eye, he went on. So I decided to honor her that day by carrying the booklet with me. When I realized I couldn't kill you, I left it behind on impulse. He leaned forward again and squeezed my arm. I was so happy when I saw you'd picked it up, and it thrills me that you treasured it so well. Owen raised a hand to cover his mouth as he snickered. Though, I'll chalk your actually buying into the time travel shit as the credulity of youth. I blinked as I tried to order everything he was saying in my mind. Okay, so... Wait. You're saying your mom was dead when I saw her at the bus stop growing up? Owen rolled his eyes. Jesus, no. That was me. I know I'm older now without the school marm get up, but you can't remember enough to see it was me that day? He... He was right. I'd put it off as a family resemblance, but if he'd made himself look older back then and used a more feminine voice, I could see it being him, even if I didn't understand why. Did you do all this because you thought you had a dream about me back then? A dream that you were supposed to kill me? His gaze grew colder. Not thought I did. I did. And no... I had never seen or known about you before the dream, and yes, it was specific enough that I knew it was you, though I admit I didn't understand the details at the time. That's why I made the mistake of thinking I was supposed to kill you that day. I felt my stomach turning to ice as something occurred to me. That's why you said that. It's different than it's supposed to be. Owen immediately brightened. Yes, very good, yes. That's exactly right. He chuckled. <laughs> our family is strong with guiding dreams for our important prey, but they are still dreams of a sort. Slippery and easy to misinterpret if you're young and dumb like I was. He shrugged. Still, when I sat down next to you, I immediately saw my mistake, and I was actually relieved. Even growing up like I did, I was still pretty new to hunting, and the idea of killing a kid... He was messing with me a little. The man's face grew a shade of red. I even worried at first that I'd let you go out of some sort of misplaced guilt, till I realized I could still see you, that is. Still find you when the time was finally right. I felt my head swimming. I wanted to run, but something told me I'd never make it to my car or any kind of help, and even if I did, I wasn't sure it would stop him. I just needed to keep him talking, buy time until I thought of an escape, or convinced him to let me go. But... But you said you weren't going to kill me, so I guess it worked out, right? Owen shook his head slightly. No, I said I wasn't going to kill you today. 
and I won't unless you make a scene. But it's not your time quite yet. When he grinned at me this time, I saw a hungry-looking wolf. But it's much, much closer than it was before. Please, please don't. Just let me go and forget about me. The man folded up the knife and slipped it into his pocket as he studied me. Don't ruin this with begging. I've found you quite likable, all things considered, and I'm glad I decided to share this with you. Yes, it will make you dread and worry until the day comes, but maybe it'll also help you understand that it's a worthwhile sacrifice you're going to be making. I can feel... Apotheosis, or at least epiphany, in your blood. And I promise not to waste it. He leaned forward and patted my leg. I'll always treasure your death. I sat staring for a while, afraid to move or even breathe, casting about for some magic combination of words or actions to scare him off or make him change his mind. But there was nothing. All I could do was survive the encounter, go to the police, and then make sure I never saw him again. What are you supposed to do it then? I knew I'd said the words, but I barely recognized my own voice. It drifted out of me, disconnected and thin, to hang between us. And I didn't really expect him to answer, but then he did. March 19th, 2021. I let out a gasp. The certainty and solidity of this prediction cutting through me like cold wind. Uh, okay, uh, um, where? Where's it going to happen? So I can make sure I'm fucking far away from there. Owen shrugged. I don't know. Me meeting you, telling you all this, it's going to change things. You'll try to get help, get me arrested or something. When you realize no one can find me, you'll try to run. Maybe even hide. He sighed softly. I didn't tell you this to make your last years full of fear and trying to escape, but I can see why it would go that route. He patted my leg again. I know it's probably going to sound insincere, but I encourage you not to give in to that fear. Live your life. Appreciate it more because you know it has a short expiration date. Don't waste it worrying about me. I surprised myself by laughing bitterly. <laughs> sure. Just give up. Make it easy for you, right? It was Owen's turn to look surprised. No, not at all. I thought you understood. He leaned toward me, his face serious but not unkind. I can always see you, like a distant light, no matter where you go. I've seen you since the day of the dream, and I'll see you until I take that light out of the world, and no matter where you go, no matter what you do, it won't matter. I'll always find you. I jumped as I heard a hiss a few feet away. Looking up, I saw the bus had arrived. Owen stood up and gave me a parting nod before getting onto the bus. The driver looked past him and called to me. You coming too? I shook my head, and the bus took my killer away. In the almost three years since, I've tried to live my life while also protecting it. I did go to the police, but... They never found Owen or anything about who he really was or where he'd gone. Maybe they thought I was lying or crazy, I don't know, but after this first month, I gave up trying. For the next two years, I lived my life fairly normally. Got an alarm system and a gun, but not much else changed other than my being more frugal than normal. I started tucking away what money I could, when I could, not admitting to myself until late last year... What exactly I was doing was building up resources so I could run. At the second week in January, that's exactly what I did. I traveled to New York, and then to London, and then from there I went to France where I'd already paid cash to rent a small house in a tiny village outside of Nice. 
I didn't speak a word of French before December, and I'd never really wanted to go there, but I thought that made it a better spot than somewhere I might have talked openly about or searched the internet before. As it turned out, the town was beautiful, and the people were very warm and friendly. And by last month, I could stumble along enough in their natural tongue to keep most of them from having to revert to English out of pity. My life here is a good life that I'm coming not only to appreciate but truly love. I'd planned on going back at the end of my lease, but as more time passes, the more I begin to wonder if I'll ever leave at all, especially after today. This morning I was walking out past the edge of town when I saw a figure standing under a distant tree. It was far enough, I couldn't be sure, but it looked like an old woman in a long, dark blue dress, her head wrapped in a thick gray shawl. An old woman. Or someone wanting to appear as one. I tried to act casual, not glancing in their direction again until I was close enough to get a better look, but when I did, they were gone. I told myself it was nothing, my mind playing tricks on me as I got only two days from the date of Owen's promise. I spent a lot of time in the past couple of years learning to control my fear, and by the time I reached the house, I was almost at peace again. That's when I stepped inside and found the gift waiting for me on the kitchen counter. It was a wooden chess piece. A knight. Originally, it had been a deep blue, but you can hardly tell it now. Hidden as it was under the new layer of paint still drying across most of the horse's head and neck, the color vivid against the pale countertop. It was a deep and dark shade of red. <laughs> 